In this lecture, we're going to continue working with ideal diatomic gases. So just a review that you saw in the last lecture. For the energy of an ideal diatomic gas, there are four contributors. There is the electronic energy, the translational energy, and the vibrational energy, which we dealt with in the last lecture. And in this lecture, I'd like to focus on the remaining term, that is, the rotational energy and its contributions to the total. In order to compute that energy, we can use the quantum mechanical rigid rotator uh, Schrodinger equation to compute allowed energy levels and degeneracies. And as we saw early on in the course, within that approximation, the energies are given by the equation shown here. So they depend on a quantum number j, and the quantum number expression j times j plus 1 can range from 0 when j equals 0 to increasingly high integer values. Uh, and there's a prefactor involving h bar squared and the moment of inertia of the molecule. And the degeneracy of these levels is 2j plus 1, where j is the quantum number. So if we then construct a partition function over levels, so we'll include the degeneracy explicitly in the summation, then we would write it this way. It's the sum from j equals 0 to infinity, 2j plus 1, e to the minus beta, the energy expression. It's a little bit more convenient just from a manipulation of the equation standpoint and also for uh, conceptual purposes to define a rotational temperature, much as we defined a vibrational temperature when working with the vibrational partition function. And so the goal effectively is to take all of the constants that appear in this energy expression other than beta and to replace them with this rotational temperature, capital theta, and it is then h bar squared over 2 times the moment of inertia times Boltzmann's constant, which of course is lurking here in uh, beta. Beta, remember, is 1 over Boltzmann's constant times temperature. So when we take that approach, the rotational partition function becomes sum over j equals 0 to infinity, 2j plus 1, e to the minus theta, rot, so the rotational temperature, times j times j plus 1 divided by temperature. So that's what's left from beta when we take the Boltzmann's constant out, a 1 over t term. Now, if we would like to uh, solve for that uh, expression, unfortunately, there's no closed form solution for that series. So we can't just look it up and see what it converges to as we sum out to the, to the last term. However, just as for the translational partition function, if it's the case that the energy levels are sufficiently closely spaced, we can replace this sum by an integral. And we can ask the question, what, what would it take for those energy levels to be very closely spaced? Well, it requires that the argument of the exponential is very small, essentially. So as j is increasing, we're not really changing this argument very much. And a way to make it very small would be to make the rotational temperature theta small relative to the actual temperature t. So that's the condition for making this replacement of the sum by the integral, that the rotational temperature is considerably smaller than the actual temperature in which we're interested. So let's just uh, take a look at a few typical diatomic gases and see if this condition is satisfied under typical conditions for typical gases. So recalling exactly what is the rotational temperature, it's the quotient of h bar squared with 2 times the moment of inertia times Boltzmann's constant. So the only variable in there that depends on the nature of the molecule is the moment of inertia. And remember, the moment of inertia gets larger and larger as the masses of the two atoms involved in the bond gets larger and larger. So we would expect, as the diatomic gets heavier, uses more heavy atoms, then the rotational temperature should go down. And if we actually carry out the calculation using actual atomic masses and bond distances, since the uh, moment of inertia depends on bond distance as well, we get these results. And so what you see is, as expected, the lightest possible diatomic, that's molecular hydrogen using protium as the nucleus, so no neutrons, just a mass of one, has a rotational temperature of 85.3 Kelvin. All the others are much, much smaller. Of course, if you do have a proton, as you see here for hydrogen chloride or hydrogen bromide. Now we have sort of low teens down to 12 for the rotational temperature, Kelvin. So those are very cold temperatures, obviously. And as we go to two heavier atoms like carbon monoxide, nitrogen, nitrous oxide, and so on, 
single-digit rotational temperatures, ultimately by the heavier dihalogen molecules, chlorine and bromine, below 1 Kelvin. So certainly if we're interested in a gas at room temperature, which is 298 Kelvin, we have satisfied the condition that the rotational temperature is much, much lower than the observed temperature that we're working with. So that's easily satisfied then. Really the only gas that occasionally it might be of interest would be molecular hydrogen working at quite cold temperatures. Well, let's uh, then replace our sum with an integral. And it turns out this is a very friendly integral. So statistical mechanics is occasionally very kind to one. And so if we look at that integral, it might look a little bit imposing, but let's just make some quick substitutions. Uh, let's call j times j plus 1 by a new variable name. We'll call it x. That means that dx, I have to take the derivative of the right-hand side. So if I think of that as j squared plus j, that's pretty easy to take a derivative of. I'll get 2j plus 1 all times dj. And so that's what's right here. And then I'll also uh, put in a variable a, which is going to be my rotational temperature divided by the temperature of the system. If I now rewrite my integral using all those substitutions, I get integral 0 to infinity dx e to the minus ax. And probably no one really needs to go to an integral table to look that one up. That's pretty trivial. And so the solution is minus 1 over a e to the minus ax evaluated at the limits on this definite integral. So e to the minus a times infinity gives 0. And e to the minus a times 0 is e to the 0. So that's 1. So I'll get minus, minus 1 over a. And you just end up with 1 over a. And what was a? Well, a was the rotational temperature divided by the temperature. So the solution, the whole partition function, is just the temperature divided by the rotational temperature. It's a tremendously simple expression. Of course, we can uh, then re-expand what the rotational temperature is. And if we do that, if we put back in the constants and the moment of inertia, and uh, if we want to express h bar squared in terms of Planck's constant and the 2 pi's, remember h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, we get this expression for the rotational partition function. 8 times pi squared times the moment of inertia, so that's the molecularly dependent quantity appearing in the partition function, times Boltzmann's constant times the temperature divided by Planck's constant squared. Well, with that partition function in hand, we can now compute useful properties of the gas as an ensemble. And so if you remember, the ensemble energy is equal to number of molecules times Boltzmann's constant times t squared times the partial derivative of the log of the partition function with respect to temperature. So we'll plug in our partition function. Here it is appearing again. It has a very simple dependence on temperature. When I take the log, all of these terms will break out as separate terms. The only one that depends on t will be actually log t. And the derivative of log t with respect to t is just 1 over t. And so when I carry out this multiplication, I'll end up with this very simple total rotational energy, nkt. If I'm working molar, n would be Avogadro's number, and this would be rt. Recalling that the heat capacity is simply the partial derivative, excuse me, the actual derivative of the uh, expectation value for the rotational energy and a molar quantity in this case. I'm looking at molar heat capacity. With respect to T, well, the derivative of RT with respect to T is just R. So the molar heat capacity of a diatomic ideal gas is R. And a way to think of that, if you remember in the translational partition function when we worked with it, we found that there was one half R contribution to each of the translational degrees of freedom. There's an x, a y, and a z mode of translation, each contributing one half r. A way to think about a diatomic, so if my hands are the atoms, it can rotate in two directions. I can rotate like this, or I can rotate end over end, so kind of like that. So if you think of the two ways that a diatomic can rotate that are unique, each of those contributes one half r, and they add up then to r. There is no rotation about its axis. That doesn't change anything. So that's what is sort of unique about a linear molecule. So two degrees of rotational freedom, and they each contribute r over 2, just as each degree of translational freedom contributes r over 2. All right, well, let's uh, pause for a moment. I'll let you take a look at a self-assessment problem, see if uh, you're picking up on these concepts, and then we'll return. All right, the last item I'd like to look at, just to make a contrast with the vibrational partition function. You might remember that at typical temperatures, say room temperature, 
we found that for most molecular vibrations, unless they have very low vibrational frequencies, almost all of the molecules would be found in the ground vibrational state. And we also know that in the translational levels, those are extremely dense and easily accessed. Well, what about the rotational energy levels? So, if we wanted to compute the fraction of molecules that you would find in a given rotational level, remember what the formula is for fraction in a level. It's degeneracy times e to the minus beta, the energy of that level, divided by the full partition function. And so if I plug in then for an arbitrary level that the degeneracy is 2j plus 1, and the energy is rotational temperature times j times j plus 1 divided by t, so I'll just simplify that and make it look like this. Well, increasing j, you would expect to see the, the fraction increase because 2j plus 1 is increasing. So the degeneracy favors more and more occupation of higher levels. On the other hand, the exponential, as j is increasing, because it's e to the minus this quantity, is being killed off as j goes to higher and higher levels. So it's a question of how long does it take before the exponential dominates, because this is a linear increase and this is an exponential decrease. And if we just pick an example molecule, let's do carbon monoxide, and we'll look at it at 300 Kelvin. And so if you recall from a table I showed earlier, the rotational temperature for carbon monoxide is only 2.8 Kelvin. So we can actually uh, carry out the calculation, plug in the necessary moment of inertia, which would appear in the rotational temperature, and here's the distribution you get. You get that there's less than 1% in the ground rotational state. It goes up for a while, it peaks at about the seventh rotational energy level, and that's a little less than 9%, and then the exponential begins taking over, and the population decreases and decreases. But there's still appreciable population of the 20th rotational level and above. And so rotation is somewhere in between translation and vibration, as we'd expect, given that the spacing of the energy levels is somewhere in between translational and vibrational energy levels. That's what contributes, in some sense, to the heat capacity's ability to put energy into the rotations and not necessarily into the translations, which causes the temperature to go up, so that it takes more energy into a diatomic than into a monoatomic, in order to raise the temperature by the same amount, because we'll be exciting rotations easily just as we excite translations easily. All right, well, that comp completes our, our examination of the rotational partition function itself. In the next lecture, let's put all of these pieces together and actually work with a full ensemble partition function, capital Q, for the ideal diatomic gas.